And again, uh, let's just give God praise in the house today, and uh, let's just thank Him for all He's done. Father God, we are truly grateful, Lord, for this grace we sing about, for the salvation we sing of. And Father, I just pray that if there be any in here who have not trusted Jesus uh, for their Savior and Lord, Father, that you would move on their heart today, open it up to understanding, and give them, Lord, the salvation and grace we all speak of. And I just pray that uh, you would just move in the rest of us, Lord, that it, it would be your words that they hear and not the words of a man. And Father, that uh, you would be able to use this for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, today's title of the message is Alive from the Dead. You're going to see why it's called that here shortly as we go through this passage in uh, Romans chapter 6. Uh, so we have a baptism today. As you'll see, our baptism is set up and Nestor is being baptized. And uh, he's actually, I believe, watching the kids. So strange. Uh, normally uh, he'd be in here, but he's already serving. So that's a, that's a good example he's already setting. All right. But uh, baptism, as everyone knows, is a symbol. It is meaning it's a sign that represents something. Okay, Uh, we should all have a biblical understanding of what baptism symbolizes, so that we don't misrepresent the word of God when we're sharing or witnessing with others. We need to go to the Bible for understanding. So salvation, when you look at your Bible, it's not a requirement for salvation. In other words, it's not a component that must accompany your salvation. It is faith in Christ uh, What is what saves, okay, period. And if you look throughout the scripture, it never says Christ plus anything. It's faith in Jesus is what saves a person, okay? Uh, However, I believe that uh, the Bible teaches that baptism is vitally important to the believer. It's vitally important. Um, It's not something that we should be willing to forego or skip, uh, we ought to be committed to Jesus Christ and baptism in a very outward, symbolic way demonstrates to all those who witness that we are committed to Christ, that we are His, that we are followers of His, that we are His disciples, and that we understand what it symbolizes, okay? Uh, when I have somebody say, well, I want salvation, I just don't want to do the baptism thing. You're not committed. You're not ready to do that. You're not ready to follow him anywhere, any place, if you're not even willing to obey his first command, which was to believe and then be baptized, okay? So it is vitally important to the believer. And, you know, look, this is a Southern, what? Baptist church, (laughs) okay? So it's prominent in what we teach and say, but remember, only Jesus can save. That's why the thief on the cross who couldn't say, hey, well, let me down from here and get baptized and then put me back up so I could be saved. He didn't need that. It was his faith that commended him salvation, okay? And so let's look at some passages uh, of Scripture because we know that God will save you because of uh, your faith in his Son. And uh, we know that this is an outwardly demonstration of our union with Christ. Let's look at these passages together for understanding and instruction and then also that we might make application uh, in our commitment to Christ, all right? So Romans 6, uh, chapter or chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Uh, Paul is, is, uh, had written to the Roman church, and he says this. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid, how shall we that are, look, dead to sin, That's an important verse right there. We'll get back to that later. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He says, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Okay, that's a kind of a hint of where we're headed. He says, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as. Now notice that like. I don't want you to miss that. Okay, like just means in the it, it, symbolically or in a way in a figure. So like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. 
For we, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, so he wouldn't actually die uh, physically, but it's a likeness, uh, we shall also be, or we shall also be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. He says, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he lived, he liveth, or in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, uh, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as though as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under what? Under grace. All right? Amen? That, that is a great passage, and there's so much understanding to be had in there that we might uh, be able to comprehend and share with others uh, that understanding. That is the goal today. So first off, the first point is this, that we were dead in our sin, okay? That means if, you're, if, if you don't know Jesus and you're just uh, somebody who's going about life doing your thing and you have sin, uh, you're you're the walking dead. You're already dead. You're already condemned. You haven't yet believed on Christ. You are already condemned and on your way to a devil's hell. I'm just telling you what the Bible teaches. Okay, you want a lot of verses to go with that? We can sit and look at them afterwards. I'll be happy to sit with you. But this this faith in Christ is required in order to deal with the sin problem. Okay. So we're dead in our sins. Uh, turn over to Colossians. Okay, you got Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, and then Colossians. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. Now this is the same apostle Paul writing uh, the letter to the Colossian church as well. And he says this. He says, and you, what, what does it say? Being what? Dead in your sin, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, that means made alive, together with him, having forgiven you, how many trespasses? All trespass. Trespass, just another word of uh, you trespassing or treading upon uh, someone else's property, right? We No trespassing. You're not allowed to encroach on this. Well, when we sin, we're encroaching upon God's holiness. Uh, let me just say this for, for you younger people, you'll, you'll understand this lingo. God don't play that. He don't play that. As a matter of fact, your sin, my sin, it was a capital punishment. It deserves death. Why? Because you're treading upon a holy and righteous and pure God in whom there is no sin and he is not going to embrace you with sin. Okay? That's just what the Bible will, will demonstrate over and over again. And so sin must be atoned for, okay? Baptism, we talk about baptism. The reason why it is important is uh, the baptism is dealing with the sin problem, okay? Uh, baptism, therefore, is a symbol of death. So if there is a sin, then something must be sacrificed. It takes innocent blood to cleanse your sin and mine. They used to use animals until the Messiah would come, uh, right? And so the animals, they covered sin and take it away. 
but the Messiah came who would take away the sin of the world. And that's why we're not still killing lambs. That's why we don't build a, a altar and swing golden censers about and uh, offering, you know, uh, innocent blood to the Lord. We don't need that. It's already been done once for all. Okay? And we need to understand that. So when we talk about baptism, if we're sinners and it deserves death, um, what am I saying? I got to be put to death. Right? So we talked about in Romans 6 how that we're buried in the likeness of his death. When Jesus died, where did he go after that? Immediately. Like he, they took him down from the cross and where'd they stick him? In a grave. It's a tomb, but the idea is you're buried. You're sealed up. You're closed off. He died. All right? So when we go under the water, that's symbolic of our burial. We, we need to understand. It's by immersion. All right? We don't bury people by getting a little bit of dirt and just sprinkle it on them. Go, ah, that's good enough. Go home. We don't do that. We put them under the ground. In fact, uh, I think they bury six feet under for two reasons. One, you ain't getting out of there, all right? Not that you could anyway, but it keeps the animals away and even the smell doesn't escape something six feet under. So we're good and buried when we're dead, right? We're way down there. Uh, it's not done hastily, uh, you know. So that's why we're buried, immersed underwater. In fact, baptism if you study the word, it's a transliteration of a word. In other words, we just say what the Greeks use, and theirs is baptizo, which means to immerse. It does not mean to sprinkle or dash, okay? That's why that's not a good uh, symbol of our death and burial. We got to go under, okay? I, I remember uh, one time I had somebody get baptized, and for whatever reason, the water, you know, the way it plays, uh, it didn't get all of the man's hair wet. And uh, it just got most of him under. His face was under, but his part of his hair was sticking out. And I had uh, somebody come to me after and say, you know, he didn't go all the way under. I said, well, I'm going to do it again. I'll have to bury him again. Look, I think it was close enough, right? I, I think it was close enough. So we didn't actually have to baptize him again. It, he, he was willing to be buried all the way. I just didn't push him down and get a knee on him and hold him down there. I'll do that today. I'll get in there and and uh, we'll go WWE, but he's staying down till I say otherwise. But uh, we just we just need to know that when the Bible talks about being dead in sin, what that entails. Uh, Romans six three talks about this a little bit. Uh, it says, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death. So what are we doing? We're saying, look, just like he died, we, we needed to die. What, are, what, what in us needs to die? What? The sin? Yeah, you. You need to die. I need to die. You know, when, when I find a couple arguing, uh, I heard a pastor say this once. He says, somebody's got to die. Somebody must be put on the altar. Somebody has to be dead to the flesh and the pride and winning. Somebody has to die before it can be right. And preferably, both of them need to die to the, to the attitude. But you know what? My dad used to say this. He used to say, it takes two to argue, son. Not that I was arguing with him, but he was trying to teach me about arguing. It's like, look, if you just don't argue back, it's over. And I learned to diffuse arguments that way. We're not talking about, you know, trying to arrive at some logical conclusion about something and you produce an argument. I'm talking about fighting in an argument. Somebody's got to die. Look, winning's not that important. Okay? Uh, being right isn't that important if after being right, you lose. It's not that important. Just die to it not that hard okay well when we talk about our sin look we're saying what jesus had to do for us we agree with because i was dead in my sin i was going about uh 
as an offense to God. In fact, people that don't give their life to Christ, they're spoken of elsewhere in Romans that said they're storing up wrath unto the day of wrath. In other words, you're, you're stocking up on God's wrath. You're just piling it higher. Every offense. You know, I had a guy that um, I went to pray with and, and he, he was facing the judge and uh, they busted out his rap sheet. And it was this long. I mean, it was page after page unfolding. And I looked at the back of it and it was full also. Two pages, I mean, two sides full of one charge after the other. The rap sheet. What was that? Hey, you know what? I said, I said, you know, I'm here to pray with you, but I said, I gotta be honest with you. The the level of this offense, you go you can get put away for a little while. You're going to jail. This guy's gonna look at this rap sheet and go, he hasn't learned since he was 10 that this is a problem. And he was in his well into his 30s. He was a father. You know what happened to him? That judge wrapped the gavel and gave that guy about three years. And it's what he did. Look, when we sin and don't deal with the sin, we're storing up wrath to the day of wrath. If you die without Jesus, whatever your rap sheet says, that's what you're going to face. That's what I would have faced. That's why Jesus uh, had to die. We need to understand that, okay? We need to understand this also. It tells us in Romans 6, 23, it, I have a verse up there for that, but it says, for the wages of sin is what? You know, wages, we all work for a wage, right? What do we call our wage when we get that piece of paper? It's our what? It's our paycheck. It's not charges, it's our paycheck. But in a sense, it's a charge because we're saying, hey, we did the service, the labor, you're get, we're charging you for that. You're paying us this. That's our wage. You know what the Bible says? The wage, the paycheck, the payment for your sin, my sin, was what? Death. Or you know what? We already settled out of court. We already said, hey, Jesus died for me, and I accept payment. God, that's the wage for my sin, and your sin is his death. He did it for me. He paid. Now, what did he pay for? We sing the song sometimes, Travis sings it. Jesus paid some. Is it how's it go? Oh, he paid it all. And uh, we owe him a little bit. All to him, what? I owe. You know, we sing that stuff, but I wonder how many of us feel that way. We'll say it, we'll sing it, we'll preach it. But does he have your all? Or does he got some of you? Or maybe a little bit of you? You know, it shows up first in your giving. Uh, we're not a church that cares about your giving. We're not asking for it. We're not begging you for it. All right? Well, God orders. He pays for it. He laid on somebody's heart to give in accordance with his, his giving to us. But I'm telling you, when you want to do a little personal search and inventory, you are what you love. And if you love your money and you're not giving it to God, you're like hanging on to it, that's saying something about you. Okay? You're not saying all to him I owe. You say, well, this is good enough for him. He died for me. Here's a few bucks, Jesus. Yeah, I'm earning 30, 40, 50, 100,000. But here's a few bucks. Hey, watch out. Yeah, that's not a good attitude. Okay? But we were dead in sin, and so therefore the wages of our sin was death. Uh, we acknowledge Jesus is our Savior, our Redeemer. He saved us. He saved us from the penalty of sin. He, paid, he, he saved us from death and, and the grave. And look, furthermore, He saved us from hell. Look, whatever... Whatever horror movies young people are into today, when I was a kid, we saw like Friday the 13th. I think kids today would go to that movie and kind of laugh the whole time. It, it's kind of funny. However, if you, they were to go see The Exorcist, I think that one would still scare them because you're dealing with the spiritual, okay? 
You're not dealing with just some guy you know is in makeup and a mask. You're dealing with the spiritual reality, which is that the devil is real, which makes God real. But if there is a devil, then what God said about what's happening to him and to the, those who reject Christ, that's real. You see? And even if you don't read the Bible, you can look around and you could realize we've got much to be afraid of. Okay? So, uh, we acknowledge that Jesus is our Savior, that He had to take our place, so baptism is a symbol of our death. Secondly, uh, or of His death, sorry. And secondly, it symbolizes our own death. We must die, okay? When I told you a second ago that we must die, look back at Romans 6, 4. All right, I want you to see that with your own eyeballs. It says that, therefore, we, that's us, are buried with him how? In baptism. Why are we buried with him in baptism? Because we died. He died, he was buried. Now we're dying, and we're saying we're, we need to be buried. Now, I, I told you it was a symbol. If it's not, guess what actually has to happen when I baptize you? I have to drown you. I have to kill you. Okay? If it's literal. If it's not a symbol, then I literally have to make you be dead. Some people ask that. They always go, well, how long are you going to keep me down? Like, however long it takes. You know, I don't say that to be funny, but, you know, some people have a fear of the water. They have a fear of drowning. And it's a real fear. Some people are deathly afraid of being in the water. They, they only shower. They will not get in a tub or a pool. And so I'm like, look, we're going to make sure that you're down but a second. It's symbolic. Okay? But we do need to die to sin to ourselves. And that's what it portrays. All right, verse 5 says, we were planted together in the likeness of his death. Can we read that a second ago? It's the likeness. It's the likeness. Likeness, if it's as something or like something, doesn't mean it's the thing. It just means there are some similarities or they have the same message or they have the same purpose. It's a likeness, symbolic. Colossians 2, 13 and 14 says this. You can go back there if you want. We already read some of that. But it says, uh, in you being dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him. We didn't talk too much about that part, but the quickened together, made alive together uh, with him. Okay? How? Having forgiven you all trespasses. See, that ought to just fill you with joy. Did you sin today, this morning? On your drive over, somebody cut you off? Will you tomorrow go into work? Or the next day, I think some people off them. Look, all trespasses as a believer. Past, present, future. Isn't that wonderful? See, that ought to bring you joy. And when we say, yeah, I, I'm sure I'll sin again and I'll slip up, but I know this, Jesus has covered that. He's taken that away too. And I don't want to, but I may. And I most likely will. All right? So it says in verse 14, this is what he did. And this is the part we don't want to miss. It says, blotting out, this is how he took it away. It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, which was against us. And what did he do with it? That was contrary to us. And what did he do? Nailing it to his cross. So notice that it's not being nailed to your cross. Now, we're to be crucified with him. But remember, he's getting all the cross time. He's getting all the, the, the uh, lumber time up there with the nails through him. Right? He did the dying. That's why we ought to give him our all. That's why we understand our the payment was made. Innocent blood for our blood. The just, it says, 
for the unjust. He died for us. So when we uh, get buried with him, we're buried in the likeness of his death. But this says we're also quickened together with him. How? Well, when we come out of the water, that's like he walked out of the grave. It's like that. Okay? We haven't seen heaven yet, but we're members of heaven. How? By faith in Jesus. That's the great part, right? And so what are we saying to people in our baptism? We died with Jesus. We were raised with Jesus. And one day, you know what? This body will actually die if, if he doesn't come soon. It'll actually die. But here's what I know is that one day the grave's going to open and I'm coming out and I'll be with him. So I don't care uh, about the rest of it. Uh, death for us, it's temporary. And I mean a physical death. That's temporary. Paul was able to say in, in uh, Galatians, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. Is it? Is it? Is it that for you? Like, look, what are you living for? What's your answer? It should be Jesus. That's the church answer, answer today. That's what all of us would say. I'm living for Jesus. You're living because of Jesus, but you may not be living for him. If you were living for him, the church would be a lot stronger. And I don't mean just this church. I mean the church globally would be a lot stronger if we were putting it all on the line for him. Okay? But we need to be living for him. All right? We were sinners. And because of that sin, must be atoned for, paid for, must be, uh, we must be redeemed from it. That's what he did. Here's the second thing. We were dead in our sin. We are dead now to our sin. Now, some of us may still have some worldly passions. We still may uh, hear temptation calling and we're like quick to pick up the phone. Hey, what's up? Oh, temptation? Yeah, I'll be there in a few minutes. Right? I mean, let's be honest. Satan knows what hook gets you. He knows which one might get me. He knows which one will get any of us. He's had a lot of time to work on that. He knows what makes us tick in the flesh. Okay? So, but we're supposed to be dead to it. And that's the thing that we need to uh, exercise a little bit of discipline for. But uh, the thing that is not symbolic about this is our death to sin. Now, when I say that we're dead to sin, even if we sometimes sin, it no longer has an effect. As a Christian, can you sin? Do you sin? Will you sin? Yeah, it's inevitable, right? I mean, that's what John said in 1 John. We're, we're going to sin. If we say we're without sin, he says, you are what? A liar. Uh, and your pants are on fire. He didn't say that part. But that's how you know sometimes, right? It's like you're just lying. And he says the truth's not in us. Okay, so we do all have sin. Here's the problem. What effect will sin have your, on your eternity, your salvation? as a Christian. Now, you, you'll you suffer for it. You'll suffer. Don't miss that. You'll suffer, and I'm not trying to minimize it. In fact, I think uh, Doug touched on it this morning, that, you know, if we sin, grace much more abounds. Where sin abounds, where there's a lot of sin, there's even more grace for that. And that's true. And so he says right after it, should we therefore sin? Since grace much more about? No, God forbid. What are you talking about? Don't you know what you're saying? No, if somebody had to die for my sin, the thing I ought to do reasonably is stop doing the thing they died for. Now, I don't mean all sin. Some of us have sin that's not God hasn't confronted yet because you know what? You've got this big thing back here you got to deal with, and that's small in comparison. Let's deal with the big thing. Let's deal with the stuff that's right on the table visible. And when you get through that, then he begins to show you other stuff. And you find out as you go through life, man, I am just a wretch. 
He's like, right. That's what I've been saying in the Word the whole time. That's why I had people write those hymns that we sing so that you knew exactly what you were, right? What I was. But now we're dead to it because, look, we're alive in Christ. I, I wish we could get that because you know what? When we sin, um, how many of you feel just like garbage after you've sinned? And you knew, you know, if I do that, I'm going to feel like garbage. And so you do it. And then afterwards you go, I feel like garbage. Like, right. Because you are grieving the Holy Spirit. And God has already paid for that in His Son by nailing it to the cross. And you have a broken heart now because you did something contrary to what God's Spirit is telling you to do or not do. And you did it anyway or you didn't do what you were supposed to do, now you're grieved. Well, then, I'll just ask a question. How are you supposed to find happiness living like that? How are you supposed to find any joy when you, you've got a foot on each side of the line? You can't. The only joy a man or a woman that's, been, uh, that's trusted Jesus is going to find is walking in obedience. You'll never find peace and joy any other way. Not going back to the world, to the old way of living, to, to the sin. You got to give that up. Okay, we're dead to our sins. Look at uh, Romans 6, 6 and 7. Don't you see that because we already read it, but I want you to zero in on it, okay? Romans 6, 6 and 7 says, knowing this, that our old man is what? crucified with him. Like, yeah, we're not literally crucified, but when he was hanging there dying for our sin, our sin was up there hanging with him. And so he was dying for me, for you, for the world. For what? Their sin. He's paying for it. Okay? He says that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not, what? Serve sin. All right? Sinning and slipping up is one thing. To serve it every day and be a slave to it, it owns you. How do you, young people won't say it anymore, but maybe the last generation did. You were pwned, right? Anytime you put owned, you'd accidentally hit the P, it turned into pwned. And then people said that and was like, what do they mean by that? Oh, that's what it comes to, right? But look, it says, for he that is dead is what? Freed from sin. Would you be free from sin today? Well, if you would be, you got to die. You got to die with Jesus. You got to accept the payment. The wages of sin is death. He died the death for you. All you got to do is accept that. And accept him. Okay? So, now, when I say accept him, I don't mean by some force of your own will. I mean, if the Spirit's speaking you, to you today that you are a sinner and that you will incur God's wrath and condemnation, and the only one that can take that away is Jesus, you need to acknowledge that. You need to say, Lord, you're right. I'm going to trust your payment. See, that's faith. All right? I'm going to receive what you did for me through your son. That's faith. And that's important. Okay. Uh, I've heard it said that Christians uh, can sin. Can they sin? Yeah. But then they said this. They just can't sin and enjoy it. You sin, there's a consequence. Here's one of the consequences. You grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay. When you do that, when you sin willfully, you know it's sin. You, you're going to do it. If you do it, uh, that's a sin to God, and you do it anyway. You're grieving the Spirit. And here's one thing that Satan likes to not let us be aware of. If you grieve the Spirit purposefully, you do it, you sin willfully, um, and you grieve Him, you'll be grieved. Why? Because He lives in you. If the Spirit is in you when you sin, it's going to bother you because you know you have 
encroached. You've trespassed against God's holiness. But now you have someone showing you that on the inside. That can never sit well with you or me. And so he brings that about. Okay. Uh, Ephesians 4.30. Paul teaches, taught the church at Ephesus. He says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. How long will I have the Holy Spirit? Till I walk away? No, you can't walk away. God saved you. It's not your own work. No one can snatch you uh, out of my Father's hand, Jesus said. Well, I can snatch me out. Then you're greater than the Father. You can't do it. You cannot do it. And so he saved you. He set you apart. You are sealed to the Spirit. You can't break the seal. You're sealed until the day of redemption. He who began a good work in you, who's faithful? He's faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So you're not stopping that. Right? How many of you have been Christian longer than 20 years? Look around. All right? You know what that means? Why are you still with Jesus? Can't stop it. I still believe it. In fact, I probably believe it more by far than I did when I first believed. Because he's faithful. All right? You grieve him, his spirit will grieve you. However, if I grieve him, what should I do? What'd you say? Repent. Look, 1 John 1 9 says that if we if we confess our sins, he is faithful. Look, it's his faithfulness, not yours. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from. And I like all. If you just underline every time the Bible says all, you would realize that God is on the throne. All unrighteousness. Cleanse. Confess it to him. Give that to the Lord. Acknowledge your guilt before him. Cleanse from all unrighteousness. Turn away from it. Repent. Okay? There are other ways that um, we're dead to sin as well. All right? And I, and I want to point out three things that are important. First one, uh, we're dead to sin's control over us. All right? As Christians who have been set free from sin and death, yes, we can sin, but when we do it now, guess what? We do it willingly, purposefully. We don't do it because we're a slave to sin any longer. We do it because we want to. Now, here's the weird part. How many of us would say in the spirit, man, we want to sin? Nobody. So it's really us obeying the flesh when we sin willfully, okay? That's something we want to do. That's something we know not to do in the Spirit. And that's the struggle that Paul had when he wrote Romans 7. The thing I would, that means the thing I I know I should do. He goes, that I don't do. He goes, the thing I would not, I would never do that. I'm no longer that fleshly guy. He goes, that I do and I keep doing. Why does he keep doing it? Because he's yielding to the flesh. Maybe he was blowing his stack and yelling at people. He seemed to be a pretty ill-tempered guy if he was in his flesh. Right? But when he was in the spirit, he did what he ought to do. But then sometimes he didn't do that. He said, the thing I would, that I don't do. Well, you know what we ought to do? We, We ought to obey Christ. And we don't always do that. So we're dead to sin's control over us. This is what Romans 6.14 says. We read it. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. We, we say amen to that. Yeah, sin doesn't rule me. It's not my boss. But sometimes it's our boss, isn't it? And sometimes we, uh, we give in to sin. Oh, it really doesn't have dominion over us. This doesn't have authority any longer over us. We're not slaves of Satan. 
but we're slaves to righteousness, to Christ. Here's the second thing. We're, we're dead to sin's control over us. We're dead to worldly passions and desires. All right? So when he made you, he made you a new creature. You don't even have the same passions that you used to have. If you do, something's wrong. If you're given over to uh, you know, sinful ways, lustful ways, uh, maybe uh, to, to drugs, to alcohol, to you know, just, just fleshly living, then something's wrong. Something's uh, not lining up with the faith that you're professing. Because look, the Bible tells us that we're dead to that. When I died, I, I don't want to live for that anymore. Look, it caused Jesus to have to die for me. And if I love him and if I'm grateful, then I don't want to keep doing what he died for. But I have a new passion. What should we have a passion for? The word of God, serving him, loving him. We ought to be looking for him. All right, what is it saying? Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. There's another all. Underline that bad boy, right? All men. And it says this, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we just deny them their place in our life, right? We should live soberly, righteously, and godly. In what world? This present world. We're not waiting for heaven so we can be free of sin. You ought to be getting freed of it from right now in this present world. Yet sometimes we feel like there's, we're dragging the ball and chain. You know what I tell people? Hey, you know that, that shackle's unlocked, right? You've been broke free of it. It's like, yeah, but I just got so used to it, I had to put it back on. But it's unlocked. You can be free from it anytime you like. Take it off. Quit burdening yourself with sin and, and troubling yourself. Grieve in your own heart. Grieve in God's heart. Be free of it. Now, that takes years to get and to do. It takes years. You're not going to do that overnight. But you know, it's got to start somewhere. Doesn't it? You know, when I first started going to church, I started reading the Bible and I realized, Oh man, it's all true. And if I if I'd have known this book and been going to church a long time ago, I would not have hurt myself and beat myself up so badly throughout life till I was 30 something years old. I could have lived a life that glorified God. If I could go back, I'd get saved at like 2 days old. I mean, it take me a day to read the Bible and on day 2 I'd be his. And I'd be a Christian ever since. You know, you're not missing nothing if you miss out on sin. You're not missing a thing. You know, you know what we say, what sinners say to me? People that don't come to Jesus, or maybe they're a Christian, but they're still hanging out with sinners and living the old life. I say, well, my friends and this and that. I'm like, they're not your friend. If they were your friend, they would say, stay home. Do not go with us. All we're going to do is hurt ourselves and damage ourselves. We're going to hurt our conscience. We're going to hurt our heart. We're going to stomp on each other's guts. And I mean that emotionally. We're going to wrong people, stab them in the back. Don't go. I care about you. I don't want you to do that and, and, and have that kind of injury done. Well, that's a friend. I say this to people. Look, I am your friend. I'm trying to point you toward what blesses you what keeps you from being hurt. I'm showing you that. And right, I'm not asking you for anything. I don't want anything. I'll spend as much time as you want in the Bible till you get that. Because I don't want you to hurt yourself. That's what a friend does. But a friend that says, hey, I'm going to sin and jack my life up. You want to come with? What kind of, how many of you want friends like that? But some of us, that's the only kind of friend we know. Why don't you hang around some Christian people, make new friends, right? That have the same passions you have or you want, right? Oh, I don't know. Christians are weird. They listen to weird music. Jesus freaks. They talk about Jesus in the Bible all the time. Oh gosh, they're really trying to hurt you, ain't they? You know? 
the baby told me he goes to, you know, a Catholic school, a daycare. I, I'd rather, and, you know, find a different kind of Christian daycare. But hey, that's what they got. But he says this, the kids at school, they call me weird. I said, well, get used to it. <laughs> get used to it because, you know, we're peculiar people in the Lord. We're strange. Right? But second thing, we're dead to the worldly uh, lusts and passion. Here's the third thing. We're dead to the fear of death. If you are a solid Christian on solid ground, you don't fear death. And you may fear the process of death. You may, you may fear in the sense that you'll be gasping for air maybe as you die, or you may be in some tremendous pain before your eyes close and you breathe your last. That, that may be somewhat fearful, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the afterlife. Like when I die, I'm going somewhere, and I know where that is. And so this life, by comparison, is not what I want more of. We're made to live, right? We, we're made to survive. But, you know, we need to learn that after this life, the pain, the suffering, it's over. And we go on to glory. And you won't regret any of that, okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says this, uh, 50, starting in 54. It says, so when the, this corruptible, this corruptible body shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal, that's somebody who can die, shall have put on immortality, somebody who won't die, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. It says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is what? Sin. That's what it is. If, you, if you're sinning, you're going to fear death because you're worried about the judgment. Okay, but the fear of death or the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. Breaking God's command, right? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a victory coming. Can't wait. All right? Here's the third point. Uh, we were dead in sin. We, uh, By faith, we are dead to sin. We're dead to it. And now we are made alive in Christ. Okay? That is a super important verse. If you're alive living for uh, the, the lust of the world and the sin and the corruption, that's not living. That is dying a slow, terrible death. Okay, we're made alive in Christ. This is what Romans 6, 12, and 13 say. We read them before. He says, I beseech you, uh, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, your logical service. Right? We died, we were buried with him, but we're raised again. Now we're walking around as spiritual new beings, uh, made alive in Christ. What are we living for? Uh, we're supposed to be living to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Our bodies are not our bodies now. They're his. What do you want me to do, Lord? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? Who do you want me to tell about you today? Uh, how can I comfort this brother or sister who's... Uh, obviously grieving, who's mourning, who's hurting. How can I show your love to them? Right? That's a living sacrifice. That's what, that's what they do. He says this, and too many Christians spend too, too much time disobeying this, but he says that, and be not conformed to what? This world. Don't do what they do. Don't live like they live. Don't be conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? Which is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Is that what you're living for? Are you walking approved? Are you walking in a way that brings him honor and glory? Does, does it shout to everybody without a word, I belong to Jesus? Do they look at you and go, yeah, that's obviously a Christian. No doubt. They don't shut up about that Jesus guy. Well, that's a good problem to have, actually. 
You know, Sean shared with me a minute ago, he was putting verses on Facebook, the daily verse. And, you know, he figured there ain't too many people looking at that. Maybe somebody would hit him with a like or something. So he quit doing it for a while. And they're like, atheists, unbeliever, are saying, hey, where's the verse of the day? Like secretly, they're like, whoa, that's a good one, man. Nobody ever told me that before. And here he is sharing the Lord while in some way that he can. All of us do that at times, right? We always have our, our thing we do. Well, that's because we've been made alive in Christ. And look, you have the word of life entrusted, committed to you. You need to share that with other people who are dead in their sins so that they can be made alive, right? That's what we do, okay? So here's, here's the three things. One, Transform life. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Second one, uh, we are to obey God's transferred will. When God moves in and takes up residence, he says, you're mine. I'm in you. I'm going to bring all these things that are holy to your knowledge. As you read the word, as you hear the preacher, as you study uh, with, with friends, as you're hearing all this, my will is going to replace your will. Does God want us to continue to obey our own will? No, because we'll do what we used to do. We'll sin. Okay? He wants to give you a new, a new purpose. He wants to take over your life. But to live is what? Christ. And to die is gain. It's supposed to be living for Him. Well, how do I live for Him? Well, I'll obey His will, not my own. It's a transferred will, okay? Romans 6, 16 through 18. We didn't read that part. We stopped at 14. Look what 16 and 18 says in Romans 6. He says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey? If you give in to sin, look, sin is of the devil. Who's, who do you belong to at that moment? The devil. He says, Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. He says, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, teaching, that was delivered you. Being made, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Hallelujah. Uh, you may obey sin from time, but that's not who you belong to. You belong to Jesus. So obey Jesus. Let his will replace your own will. Okay? Here's the last thing. It really is the last thing. Okay? Then we'll do the baptism. But we are translated to the kingdom of God. Now that's a funny thing because we actually are already there. You may not feel that way. You may not see it in a way that's tangible that you can get a hold of. But you're there and you belong to it. Okay? That's what it says in Colossians 1.13. Who, meaning God, hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen? That is what we symbolize when we say, hey, bury me in the water of baptism. Don't hold me there too long because I'm coming back up just like Jesus came up. When you come up, uh, it's not that at that moment you're his. You do that because you are. You get baptized because you know you belong to the king. I would just ask you to ponder that as we have a time invitation. Who do you belong to? Who are you yielding yourself to? Who are you giving the glory to? Who? And I would ask that you give your heart, your life to Jesus today. If you're already his, but you're not obeying him, then relinquish your own will and follow him. Repent. Do that work today. Over time invitation, I'm going to have Doug take over. We're going to get ready for the baptism. I'll bring Nestor in and uh, I'll just let Doug handle the invitation from here.